Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 93 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Gavin, and this episode is really special. Today, we talk to one of my former professors back at SUNY Cortland, where I did my undergrad, Dr. Robert Darling, or Dr. Bob, as we always called him. He is an expert on the Adirondack Mountains of New York State, uh, the ones that Mike has spent the entire summer hiking in and around. And while this episode is a little light on paleontology itself, I I really enjoyed this episode, getting to talk to one of my old professors again, as well as uh, getting to educate Mike a little bit more about uh, the, the area that he spent so much of his time this summer. Like I said, I really enjoyed this episode, and hopefully you will as well. But before we get into that, we have some housekeeping things. Uh, first, this conversation was flowing really, really well, and I didn't want to interrupt Dr. Bob to explain a, a couple of things that got a little bit more technical, so I will occasionally splice in a brief explanation for a few of those technical terms in this episode a little different than we usually do. And as always, don't forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to us on, and to follow us on our various social medias, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, to give us feedback about the show and any future topics you would like to hear about on the show. If you would like to be a guest on the show, make sure to fill out the guest form down below in the show notes. Next week's episode will probably trigger the phobias of a few people out there, including my wife, because we're talking about snakes, the wonderfully diverse, if not slightly creepy reptiles, trying their best in a world full of limbs that they sadly do not have. Make sure to send in any questions you might have about snakes for next week. And with that, here is our conversation with Dr. Bob. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 93 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And Gavin, this is one of those special episodes. It sure is. We have a wonderful guest, one of my uh, former professors back at SUNY Cortland, uh, to talk to us about a really cool topic that Mike just recently learned a whole lot about, uh, or at least, you know, explored a bunch, which is the Adirondack Mountains. So, Dr. Robert Darling, or as we always called him, Dr. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we're uh, we're really excited to have you. So, I guess Mike, f- fill in Dr. Bob about how you spent your summer. Well, so I mean, the first thing that anybody needs to know, um, whether it's Dr. Bob or my parents or, you know, just anybody listening to the podcast, is that I'm not really a smart man, and so, <laughs> and so I got it in my head. I had just like heard, I was vaguely aware that in the Adirondacks, there was these things called the 46 high peaks. And I said, well, I'm a teacher, so I've got all summer to do nothing. I'm going to hike all 46 high peaks in one summer. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah, so so <laughs> you, you say wow as though I was able to finish that. I was not. <laughs> okay. um, and so I was, and so I basically had this goal in mind before I knew what it took to, uh, to actually hike the 46 high peaks before I knew what gear I needed. I just said, this is a goal I'm going to have. Um, and so, you know, leading up to the summer, I was able to get some gear. I got the proper footwear. I got the bear canister. I learned like where the 46 high peaks were, which I did not know uh, in like, you know, early June, um, you know, less than a month before I was starting. Mm-hmm. So I, um, over the course of the summer, I was able to get 35 of the high peaks done um, after starting with zero. And it was a really fun crash course into uh, mountain climbing, into the Adirondacks themselves, into spending quite a lot of time by myself driving back and forth to and from the Adirondacks. Um, but yeah, that was that was kind of how my summer was filled up was me just saying, damn it, I am, uh, I'm going to have some fun, uh, you know, try to tackle as many of the high peaks as I can. And I, uh, I don't regret a damn thing. Nice. No, and that's that's sort of, you know, why we wanted to do an episode about the Adirondacks in general, uh, because now that Mike has, has seen a bunch of it, and, you know, uh, we took several trips around the Adirondacks, you know, for, for all my classes at Cortland, so I know a bit about them, and I, I like to think that I remember most of it. <laughs> so I figured we'd, we'd have somebody who knows uh, a heck of a lot more about the Adirondacks than other of us to, uh, to come and explain them. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and... Uh, how, how you know the Adirondacks so well? Well, uh, when I was a kid, I used to spend my summers in the Adirondacks and really in the western part of the Adirondacks where it's really not very mountainous, but you are within the Adirondack right. Park. Uh, so uh, I, I did that until I was age uh, 13. And then my family 
moved from Syracuse to the Adirondacks. So uh, I went to high school uh, in the Adirondacks, uh, as I say, on the Western side of the mm-hmm. Adirondacks. And so uh, I spent my teenage years there and then I went away to college after that. But um, I still uh, have a place uh, in, in my hometown in the Western Adirondacks. And I, 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 I go there as much as I possibly can. Uh, so um, most of my experience has been um, involved with uh, trying to understand the geology and the history of the Adirondacks. So uh, that's kind of the perspective that I might be able to bring. Awesome. And for for people who are not familiar, we talked about it here and there in various episodes of the podcast. We did an episode all about the geology of New York State right before I moved away from New York. And so uh, most of my background with, you know, paleontology is sedimentary rocks, and that's not much of the Adirondacks. So for for people who are not familiar, what, what are the Adirondacks in general? What is the Adirondack Park that, that you just mentioned is... So is, is there a difference between the Adirondacks, Adirondack Park? Um, yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Uh, the the Adirondacks, uh, the original name um, was uh, just associated with the, sort of the high peaks part of the Adirondacks, and that was actually named by a, a famous geologist in the uh, mid eighteen hundreds. His, his last name was Emmons. It was Ebenezer Emmons, and he was really the first geologist to go to the Adirondacks. And when he was in the high peak area, he just referred to that as the Adirondack group of mountains. And that was, okay. a, yeah, it was around eight in the 1840s uh, when he did that. Uh, and then that sort of the region sort of became known as the Adirondacks that was outside of just the high peaks area. And then in the late 1800s, uh, specifically around 1892, uh, the Adirondack park was created. Um, and so they kind of drew a, a blue line around um, an area in northern New York State and just referred to this as the Adirondack Park. And it's a state park. Um, and the boundary itself has changed a little bit over the years. It's actually, mm-hmm. it's actually expanded. Um, and now uh, the Adirondack, Adirondack Park is about 6 million acres of land. And about half of it is private and the other half is is public. And so it's this balance, this, this blend of private and public land uh, that's really, kind of, we've kind of had a model that has worked very well for decades, uh, but it's really kind of a unique park and it's got this mixture of, of both uh, private and public land. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure, Mike, you can sort of speak to this as well, being sort of a, a civics, uh, you know, high school teacher, but having some kind of state, and private partnership like that is, is like, like you said, is, is pretty uncommon. I don't know of too many other places like that. Yeah. I mean, I can't, um, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, but I do know that it is one of those things that um, like it is, it is a conscious give and take in the Adirondacks um, where, you know, visitors and everything are, you know, like in, encouraged to, uh, you know, be careful when you are on private land, when you are hiking to just kind of respect the trail. Um, and respect where you are, because it is not, you know, it is not just granted forever that people are going to be able to continue to use, you know, these kind of private lands. Um, I do, um, I do remember, um, or at least it ring a bell. Um, what was the name of the person in the 1840s that was going around and you know, kind of discovering the Adirondack area? Well, um, well the, the first geologist to visit, I believe his name was Ebenezer Emmons. In, Emmons, okay. Emmons, um, yeah follow-up question on that um was he like a real jerk or something (laughs) (laughs) uh there were some there were some battles between uh various uh geologists and i guess i don't know the whole story i've read some uh i guess contentious arguments uh amongst geologists at that time uh and emmons may have been (laughs) may have been involved in that so I don't know if I characterize him as a jerk. I, I'd have to read a little bit more about it to, to know for sure. So I don't know anything about um, the man himself or anything. I just know that there is an Emmons Mountain um, among the 46 high peaks. Right. And I hated that thing. It is, <laughs> it's, it's part of what's called the Seward Range um, after uh, William Seward. Um, and just 
there's four mountains around there, three in a row. There was Seward, Donaldson, and Emmons, and there's a, a fourth one just off to the side. Easily my worst couple days when I was out there. Hated it. I will never go back. I don't understand people that want to do it twice. So I hear Emmons, and all of a sudden I have some Vietnam flashbacks <laughs> to early on in my journey when I was just like, oh, I can totally do this. And I learned you might not be able to. That's funny. I, I think, Mike, that that mountain is named after Ebenezer Emmons. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, that there's a correlation there. I don't know anything. Now, the Seward Range, I've never hiked before. But my understanding is that there are a lot of uh, a lot of bushwhacking involved in those peaks. Am I right? Um, the uh, the way that I went up, um, it was it, it wasn't too bad with the bushwhacking on the way up. But once you get on top and there's, you have the three mountains in a row, then you've got some bushwhacking, some pretty difficult scrambles, which for those of you that um, that are not hikers listening to the podcast, mm-hmm. bushwhacking is where the trail is not super well marked and you've got to quite literally whack your way through bush and a scramble is when you kind of have to get on all fours to climb up the mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, So on top of the mountain, it was incredibly difficult to um, kind of move around there. And then the way I went down off the side of Seward mountain was about three straight hours of (laughs) that's a long way down. If I make a wrong step. Wow. So, yeah. So yeah, it is, that was um, the toughest uh, range that I did uh, whilst, whilst I was up there. And yes, I'm on the Wikipedia page right now. The summit is named for <laughs> Ebenezer Emmons. So I vote um, as a podcast, and we've never done this before. I'm making this up as we go. But I vote. All right. I vote that we um, uh, we vote that Ebenezer Emmons is going to be the podcast villain, um, at least for now, until we anoint a new podcast villain. <laughs> I'm I'm okay with that. With with no background knowledge. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Without without even hearing this guy's name before until now podcast villain Ebenezer Emmons <laughs> uh, you crack me up so uh that's why we're glad to have you here to learn all of these new things <laughs> yeah absolutely so when uh, when most people think of mountains on the east coast of the United States most people kind of think of the Appalachians and uh now that I kind of live in the Appalachians a bit down in Pennsylvania uh People get a little contentious about what exactly is and is not the Appalachians. Uh, So what is sort of the the relationship between the Adirondacks and the Appalachians? Well, I think that uh, I think geographically they do belong to the Appalachian Mountains, Um, but geologically they don't. Uh, And what I mean, what I mean by that is you have to explain this to a dummy like me. Okay. You just blew my mind there with a couple of words that started with G. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, uh, the Appalachian mountains that say run from Alabama up the East coast through Pennsylvania and the new England States, and then all the way up into Canada. Um, most of those mountains are interpreted to be the eroded remnants of what we call the Allegheny orogeny. And that was right. a that was a mountain building event that occurred about 250 million years ago, and it w- it occurred when Africa, the northwest coast of Africa, collided with North America to produce this this uh, very large mountain range about 250 million years ago, and then Africa split away. The Atlantic Ocean was created, and those mountains that were formed they kind of got sort of preserved here on the east coast of the, of the United States, and so. The age of the traditional uh, Appalachian Mountains um, is about, they've been around for, they've been eroding for about 250 million years. Um, And the Adirondacks don't show any real evidence of of any kind of movement or metamorphism um, or any kind of faulting that... uh, occurred at the at this time this 250 million year old time frame so the adirondack mountains never experienced any of the effects of the allegheny uh orogeny whereas in pennsylvania and in new england uh right. d- down in the yeah in alabama and, and north carolina they certainly did so i don't know if that helps to clarify it but that's that's the main reason geologically they are not part of the allegheny orogeny Okay. 
And and just for reference for for listeners, because a couple episodes ago we did uh, an episode about the Permian period, which is uh, in that sort of given time frame. So that sort of come together of North America and Africa is roughly lining up with the come together and then splitting apart of Pangaea. And uh, so that's, you know, I mean, that makes sense. You know, lots of continents coming together. That's that's traditionally how you build mountains. That's how the the Himalayas, which I know you've also sort of spent some time in, <laughs> yes, uh, have have formed. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So if, so, I guess then the follow up is if the Adirondacks don't show much evidence of being involved in that, where where do they come from? Oh man, Gavin, you had to you had to start off with this question right away. That's that's, that's fantastic. Well, you you got to start at the beginning. Yeah, you know? you're oh, you're absolutely right. He learned um, from the best. It's uh, it's, um, it's really one of the great mysteries of of uh, I guess folks that study the Adirondacks. Uh, we really don't know. We don't really have a good handle on the origin of the Adirondack Mountains. Um, there are a couple of important studies that have been done, um, some of which have you know really good data to back them up, uh, and other ones that are not so well, um, I guess, supported by the evidence. Uh, there was a study done in the mid 1970s um, by the former state geologist of New York State. His name, his name was Ingvar I. Saxon, and Ingvar published a paper in 1975 that indicated that the Adirondacks were, were a, a rapid uplift and that they're actually experiencing contemporary, present-day uplift today. Uh, and he actually cited in his paper an uplift rate of about uh, two to three millimeters per year. Um, wow. And that's a very, very fast uplift rate. Uh, did, did he say what the cause of that would be? He, he did uh, write... Uh, an interpretation of that cause. And in 1975, um, hotspots, tectonic hotspots, were pretty popular. So hotspots are areas deep within the earth that, for a variety of reasons, get hotter than the surrounding areas, which melts some of the rock around it and causes it to rise, like the wax in a lava lamp. For more on tectonic hotspots, see last episode, episode 92, about volcanoes. And what Ingvar Mm. did is he said... That he interpreted that there was a hot spot underneath the Adirondacks, a present day hot spot, and that that hot spot was causing this circular mountain range uh, in upstate New York and causing it to rise today. Um, and uh, all I can say about that is that there's very little to no supporting evidence of that. Um, hot spots, you know, are hot. Um, right. <laughs> and, and there is no evidence of elevated heat flow in the Adirondacks. You know that hot spots uh, have copious amounts of basaltic volcanism, and there is no basaltic volcanism of any kind um, in or modern day basaltic volcanism in the Adirondacks. So there, there's really no supporting evidence for a hot spot underneath the um, uh, the Adirondacks. I can also tell you that there was a very important study uh, done by uh, my former colleague, Mary Roden Tice. She was up at SUNY Plattsburgh, and she did a study in the early 2000s where she looked at um, little tiny fission tracks inside of the mineral apatite from the okay. Adirondacks. And what fission tracks are, when a, a uranium atom decays, uh, the little alpha particle go, kind of goes screaming through a, a mineral, and it leaves behind because it undergoes um, it undergoes fission, and it leaves behind a little track inside of the mineral. And those tracks um, they heal up whenever uh, the rock is is over a hundred degrees Celsius. And so what you do okay. what you do with these tracks is it's kind of important to um, your earlier question. What you do with these tracks is you count them. Uh, under the microscope, and you can kind of tell how long this mineral appetite has been at a temperature less than 100 degrees Celsius. And that okay. we, we know that these appetites all over the Adirondacks, um, those appetite fission tracks date from the Cretaceous period. 
And so they're about approximately, it varies a little bit, but about 100 million years old. And so we know that all of the rocks in, that make up the Adirondacks have been cold, meaning less than 100 degrees Celsius, for more than 100 million years. So, so that, again, it doesn't show any evidence of elevated heat flow uh, underneath the Adirondacks today, or even in the last 100 million years. So, okay. so not, I, I got to tell you, I don't know too many geologists that, uh, that support the idea of a modern day hotspot underneath the Adirondacks. And right. So, this is a case where it's not like, we don't know. Like, this is a case where absence of evidence is evidence of absence. Like we can, you know, say with a reasonable amount of confidence that is the hotspot theory is just not, you know, not applicable here. I believe so, Mike. I, I believe that it just doesn't have the supporting evidence uh, for it. Now, you know, were there hot spots in the in the East Coast of the United States in the past? Um, there was a, a hot spot called the Great Meteor Hot Spot that was. That's a great uh, name. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's also in the it's also a Cretaceous age hot spot, I believe, um, somewhere in the uh, the late uh, Mesozoic, um, but nothing, nothing recent and no evidence of any recent elevated heat flow. So the, the, you're right, Mike, the evidence isn't really there to support the idea. For a little bit of background, the Great Meteor Hotspot is a hotspot just like Hawaii or Yellowstone that used to be located underneath what is now New England here in North America. But over time, the continent shifted, but as usual, the hotspot stays in the same place. So you can see a chain of undersea mountains leading from New England to its current location off the eastern coast of northern Africa, which is the first time that I'd ever heard of a hotspot occurring in multiple tectonic plates. Neat. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So I guess, what, what do we know? So when, when, do the, our, when does our knowledge about the, the Adirondack sort of start in, in the grand scheme of time? Um, well, uh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we know that, uh, during the Paleozoic, the early Paleozoic, the rocks that make up the Adirondacks were eroded completely flat, um, because there are, uh, upper Cambrian age sediments, the Potsdam sandstone specifically that rest unconformably on top of the metamorphic rocks that make up the Adirondacks. So there were no mountains, um, uh, in the Cambrian. So we know it was flat in the Cambrian. For reference, for all you non-geologically inclined listeners out there, the Cambrian period was 538 to 485 million years ago. So by then, the rocks that now make up the Adirondacks existed and were already eroded flat. Dr. Bob also mentioned that we know this because some rocks sit unconformably on top of the Adirondack rocks. This means that the rocks aren't continuous, which means that there was a gap in time between when the rocks on one side of the gap formed compared to the other side. Um, and what has happened since then is, is a little more nebulous uh, because we don't really have a strong uh, rock record for um, mountain building events in that part of New York State. In other parts of New York State, we do. Right. But in the Adirondack region, uh, we don't. Um, there's a couple of interesting things. Um, so the Adirondacks have kind of a domal shape to them. Uh, when you look mm -hmm. at them on a map, they're kind of rounded, um, somewhat maybe triangular shape. Uh, and actually that was that rounded uh, shape of the Adirondack dome that actually led Ingvar Isaacson to kind of conclude that there was a hotspot. He sort of saw, saw them, they, they look kind of round. And what he thought of at the time is, you know, a hotspot is kind of round too. So, uh, so that was what he kind of, used to help his um, support his argument. Um, but we know that other mountain ranges uh, in the East Coast also have those same appetite fission track dates um, that are about the same. For example, uh, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, they have Cretaceous age uh, appetite fission tracks. Um, and in the Poconos, a little closer to you, Gavin, yeah. um, the Poconos have uh, their sedimentary rocks have detrital appetite in them. And uh, fission track studies have also shown that those are, you know, again, uh, late Mesozoic Cretaceous age as well. And so what we know is that the Poconos, the Adirondacks, and the White Mountains all kind of came up, so to speak. They all kind of passed through the 100 degree Celsius isotherm 100 million years ago. And they've both been cold ever since. 
and isotherm is a specific depth within the earth uh, that reaches a certain temperature, in this case, 100 degrees Celsius. Sort of like how if you stick a meat thermometer into a chicken, uh, you know, the farther you, you stick it in, it will be different temperatures. However, in the case of a chicken, uh, if you stick the, the meat thermometer further inside, it will probably get colder. Uh, and with the earth, you know, the, the hot part is in the middle. So if you stick that thermometer farther down in the earth, you will get warmer. Basically, we can tell how deeply these rocks have been buried since the Cretaceous because they haven't hit the 100 degrees Celsius isotherm. Uh, and so it's possible that um, what we see in northern New York State is just, uh, is just an uplift of the whole East Coast, uh, the mountains on the East Coast since the Cretaceous. And maybe what you're seeing is just the erosion of, of an Adirondack dome, a, a dome-like structure that may, may predate this uplift. Uh, and what you're seeing is places where there is, is high rock resistance and the upper part of the dome, that's where you find kind of the high peaks uh, part of the Adirondacks. And then places like central New York, um, uh, like in the, the place where the Erie Canal is and the New York State Thruway, mm -hmm. um, sort of between the Allegheny Plateau and the Adirondacks, you've got a bunch of really uh, uh, easily weatherable sedimentary rocks right. uh, in those, the Silurian rocks in there. And so maybe what you're seeing in, in upstate New York is just a, a really good case of, of sort of differential weathering where the whole, uh, as I say, East Coast and this, this part of New York State has kind of come up uh, since the Cretaceous. And we're just seeing lots of good examples of differential weathering. But that the only other thing that I want to say about that is that um, th there, I think that there may be a difference between the uplift of the Adirondacks and the formation of the Adirondack dome. Um, what, what, okay. yeah, what Ingvar Isaacson did is he put them together. He said that the dome structure is related to the uplift of the mountains. And it's entirely possible that the dome structure of the Adirondacks could predate this uplift that I'm talking about. So you had a, a, a sort of a dome structure in the subsurface, and then all the rocks are uplifted. And the, what we see in the present day are these, the core of that dome structure are a bunch of Precambrian rocks uh, that are really resistant to, uh, to weather. So those are a couple of, of things that we, I think we do know, or we can say about the Adirondacks. We just, um, it's difficult to determine the age of when mountains come up. Um, unless you have a sedimentary record of their erosion, it's, right. dif it's difficult to determine that age. So that's, a, that's a, a problem that we have in trying to understand the Adirondacks. And if I knew the answer, I'd be writing a paper right now and <laughs> submitting it to a journal. <laughs> so I don't know. So I just want to make sure I understand this. So it's possible that the high peaks are really just like the most like resistant to erosion kind of areas in that region. And that's why they are you know, so much higher than the, you know, the surrounding area. Do I understand that correctly? That is possible, Mike. Um, wow. it, it, it might be coupled. It might be coupled with uh, the, that part of the, that Northeast part of the Adirondacks may have also been um, kind of the, uh, I hate, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but kind of the, the highest part of the Adirondack dome. Uh, the, even though the dome is kind of rounded and the high peaks are in the Northeast, that may have structurally been the highest part of the dome-like structure. And so it might be a combination of both. It might be just the, that those uh, rocks, or excuse me, those mountains are in the place where the highest parts of the dome existed. But also, as, as I'm sure you know, Mike, the, uh, many of the rocks uh, that make up the high peaks are this uh, rock that we call meta-anorthosite. And it's this very plagioclase-rich uh, metamorphosed igneous rock, and it's very resistant to weathering. Um, I, it's a tough rock and I can, I can, I've never done any specific experiments with, um, with uh, weathering of anorthosite compared to other Adirondack rocks, but I can tell you as kind of a novice stone mason, I have tried, <laughs> I have tried to split a lot of Adirondack rocks and I've split some granites <laughs> and I've split some anorthosites. And let me tell you, those, that anorthosite really puts up a fight when you try to split it. So it's from my little experience, I can tell you that that anorthosite is a pretty tough rock. 
and from my lack of science background, um, I, I certainly don't know any of the, you know, the chemical processes there, but I do know um, that there was a hurricane that kind of um, that ripped away a lot of the soil from a lot of the places in the Adirondack and left a lot of really exposed rock. Yes. And that rock is still there and it's doing just fine. <laughs> so I, uh, I can 100% believe um, you know, exactly what you're talking about here with just the fact that that, that Adirondack you know, rock is, you know, it's not going anywhere. And I can, you know, that certainly seems plausible to me as an explanation for, for how we got those high peaks. Well, I think, I think it's a plausible explanation. And, you know, I, I don't know of any, I'm not aware of any studies that would kind of put some numbers on that. Um, but it's possible that uh, one of the other things that I think controls the, uh, the altitude of mountains in the Adirondacks, as well as the location of mountains, has to do with the fracture spacing that's present in those rocks. There, if you look at topographic maps of that area, you can clearly see some linear valleys um, on mm-hmm. those maps. And those are places where there are fractures in the, in the bedrock. And so if you have a part of the Adirondacks that has uh, several fractures and they're closely spaced, well, the mountains kind of in between them or the, the land in between them is not going to be very tall. But as the fracture spacing increases and you get some wider and wider distances between those big fractures in the Adirondacks, then that's where you find some of the highest mountains where the fracture spacing is widest. So, so I do think that the dome, the dome structure is a control. I do think that the anorthosite being a resistant rock is a control. But I also think that fracture spacing, major fractures I'm talking about, the trend kind of towards the northeast, that fracture spacing, I think, plays either a primary or kind of a secondary control on the height of mountains as well. Hmm. Interesting. I know. uh, So like I mentioned earlier, my, my personal background is more in sedimentary rocks. And so I'm used to thinking about it in kind of terms of bedding, but I know that that doesn't really exist in, in these types of rocks. (laughs) (laughs) You're right. It's interesting to think of, uh, but you know, typically bedding is where you see, you know, some, in, in sedimentary rocks where you see some differences in weathering, but it's interesting to think of that it would be these fractures in this, you know, these massive, uh, I guess, masses of, of metamorphic rocks. So that's, I, I hadn't ever thought about that. That's interesting. Well, I, I think your point is well taken, uh, but you know, there are metamorphic rocks that, uh, that aren't very resistant uh, to uh, right. to weathering and and there are you know there are a few places in the in the Adirondacks where there are some marbles and as you know mm. those marbles are pretty soluble and I don't know of too many marbles on the top of mountains um, they usually right. are found in valleys and then there are some uh, more schisty types of rocks in the Adirondacks and they're all biotite schists there really aren't any muscovite schists because muscovite is not stable in those rocks. Um, it, the, the rocks are too, were too hot for that. But they okay. have they have plenty of biotite. And, you know, biotite-rich rocks, they weather pretty easily. So, uh, so there may be um, a bedrock control as well that, you know, some metamorphic rocks are pretty resistant and other ones are, are hardly, hardly resistant at all. Neat. Uh, yeah. So I also have to uh, bring in a side note. So this is yeah. typically a paleontology podcast. And I remember on one of our trips, we did see some fossils. I'm not going to disclose where those were because <laughs> uh, I believe we all promised. Uh, but there are, <laughs> if you know the correct place to go, uh, there are some interesting fossils in the Adirondacks. I believe I remember hearing about this. Yeah. The secrecy you are. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, I'll play along with that. Uh, the only thing I will say is that, um, um, can I, can I at least say what the name of the fossils are? Can I do oh, that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, okay. I, I believe it was you that told us not to really tell anybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh all right. Really uh, we got to pay off. All right. No, um, the, actually it, it has been, uh, it has been published before. Uh, so it's not like it's a secret, um, but they are stromatolites. Um, and, um, these are organisms that, uh, lived in the Precambrian, uh, prior to, organisms developing the capability of having fossilizable hard parts. Um, and these stromatolites were really the main uh, organism that built limestones in the Precambrian. And right. there, there is a place in the, in the Adirondacks um, where some of those stromatolites have been preserved. They were first silicified um, in the limestone. And then when they got metamorphosed, they got converted to marble. But the, the silicification that took place 
in those stromatolites really cause them to be preserved, even at, um, in this case, the location where they are, it's, it's amphibolite facies metamorphism. So temperatures of around maybe 700 degrees Celsius and uh, maybe 650 degrees Celsius and, and burial depths of probably, you know, 20 to 25 kilometers. But it's remarkable that they actually survived yeah. that metamorphic event. So we have talked a little bit about stromatolites on the show before, but they are basically these mats of photosynthetic bacteria that would form calcium carbonate, the same material that, uh, you know, things like clams and other shelly organisms make their shells out of just through their regular bodily processes. And these bacteria would form it in these layers that would sort of stack up one on top of the other. So they make these kind of convex layer cake looking structures. However, normally they're pretty fragile, but like Dr. Bob said, these were silicified or chemically replaced with quartz before they were buried too deep. Quartz is a really hardy mineral, much hardier than the calcium carbonate that was there before, which is what allowed these fossils to survive being buried those 20 kilometers, or for us, they use freedom units, 12 and a half miles underground. Absolutely. And if I also, if I remember correctly, they were overturned. <laughs> as well. Yeah, it's interesting because the geologists working in the area who, who were mapping the rocks, they suspected that those uh, marbles were overturned even before the stromatolites were found. And when the stromatolites were uh, recognized back in 1983, uh, they, they, you know, they weren't surprised at all that, they, that the stromatolites were upside down. Interesting. Yeah, that's so. I had to I had to sneak a little paleontology <laughs> into uh, into this episode. That's fantastic. So that's sort of some of the geology. Of, obviously, you know, we could go for hours and hours about you know geology of particular areas uh, in different areas of the Adirondacks because you know it's a like you said, what was it like six million square miles or something uh, like that? Acres, so, six million acres. Oh, okay, <laughs> still uh, a lot square miles. Oh, that'd be way too big. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, so the, obviously that's a large area, so we, we don't have time to go into to everywhere. But uh, something else that people don't tend to think of the Northeast all that much of is mining. And uh, the Adirondacks actually have a pretty rich mining history that, that we actually sort of explored a little bit in, uh, in some of your classes. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I guess that the Adirondacks historically um, have been noted really for, um, I'm going to say, a, a, a few products. Um, probably most notably iron. Um, they've actually mined uh, graphite in the Adirondacks. That may have been organic graphite too, but they mined graphite to make, you may, you know, this may predate you, but you know, when pencils were yellow, uh, there was, <laughs> there was, and you could stick them in your mouth and chew on them. Um, they, oh, I got they, a story for you about a student <laughs> who went to the hospital. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> we sadly forgot about Mike's tragic student story another time, maybe. Well, many of those pencils were labeled Ticonderoga. That's the name of a That's pencil right. company. And that graphite um, in those pencils came from the Adirondacks. Uh, and so uh, graphite is one, iron is another. Um, they are still mining garnet in the Adirondacks. Uh, they started mining garnet um, on the north side of Gore Mountain, which is right in the central Adirondacks. They started mining there in 1878. Um, and they, they stopped the, that mine ran for a little over a hundred years. And now they moved over the Barton family who runs these mines or operates these mines. They moved over to the next ridge. There's a little mountain over there called Ruby mountain and it doesn't have any rubies. They're just red garnets. Um, but, uh, on Ruby mountain, they are mining garnet today. Uh, and so it's, it's probably the, the longest continuous garnet mining operations anywhere in the world. Um, and, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, those garnets from Ruby Mountain are used in, in water jet cutting. Uh, so they, they just mix these little garnet chips with high pressure water and they can cut right through steel, uh, a lot of different other kinds of metals. And it's really widely used um, in industry uh, today. So, so garnet mining is, is important. Um, and then I guess one other place that they're currently mining um, are... Uh, for this industrial mineral called wallastonite. Um, there are actually two wallastonite mines in the Adirondacks, one over near Harrisville, and the other one uh, is the Lewis mine over near the town of Lewis in the eastern Adirondacks. And wallastonite is kind of a white, fibrous, uh, pr pretty brittle mineral, and it's really used as a base for ceramics um, uh, and a number of other, uh, number of other uh, products. Uh, and so 
uh, believe it or not, <laughs> New York State is uh, is the leading producer of wallacenite in the country, uh, and so um, there are active hmm. there are active mines in the Adirondacks, and and the t- the two active ones today uh, that are most famous are the wallacenite mines. Uh, the Garnet Mine, and they're actually still over in the Northwest Lowlands. They are still at a very a smaller scale, but they're actually mining uh, zinc over there as well. So those are probably the active uh, sort of either metal or industrial mineral uh, kinds of mines in the Adirondacks. And I remember, I don't remember too many of the specifics, but I remember you taking us to a particular spot and talking about uh, some kind of big scale mining for the ramp up to World War II. Oh yes, yeah, um, yeah. I, I failed to mention that. Uh, that's a that's at the what they call the Sanford Lake ore body, and that's right in the High Peaks area. Uh, um, and there's a little there was a little town up there called Tahawas, um, and so uh, they had mining operations there. Uh, they mostly were interested in iron um, in the early part of that mining history. So so the the ore bed that they uh, discovered up there, which is mostly a mixture of the mineral magnetite and then also the mineral ilmenite. And so for your listeners, magnetite is an, is an iron oxide and ilmenite is an iron titanium oxide. And both of those minerals occur at this location in great abundance. And so in the early 1800s, they really were after that magnetite uh, because that had all the iron in it. And they mined a bunch of this ilmenite as well, and they just threw it away. Because they had ti- <laughs> they had had all this titanium in it that they didn't want, um, and then mining operations kind of uh, you know s- sort of waned a little bit, um, and then the Second World War uh, came around, and there was a huge strategic demand for titanium, and so all of that ilmenite that they threw away, and the rest of the ilmenite that was in the ground, they reopened that mine as a titanium mine. So it's the same mine, the same minerals that are in the ground. But instead of keeping the magnetite and throwing the ilmenite away, they kept the ilmenite and threw the magnetite away. Uh, <laughs> and so they and so they built a railroad in 1942. They built a railroad um, all the way to the to, to the actual mine itself uh, through the Adirondacks, uh, and they basically um, hauled out tr- uh, train car load after train car load of this ilmenite concentrate. Uh, to make uh, to get metallic titanium, they used it in aircraft parts. Uh, you may have heard of a titanium um, dioxide uh, white uh, paint pigment, um, and it is it, it's used in, in many uh, applications in in I don't know, like painting ships, for example, in the Second World War. So I got to tell you that I'm glad you brought that that story <laughs> up because that overnight that became the world's largest titanium mine within a matter of like two or three years in the second world war wow yeah it's an amazing story yeah i was like i i remembered something about titanium somewhere but didn't remember any of the specifics well it's uh you know that the uh the, there are new owners to that land up there and they you know they say we're gonna try to we're gonna start start mining titanium again up there. So hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. It takes a lot of you know resources to get a mine started, um, but yeah. that's what the plan is. And so uh, it's interesting though, because there's still plenty of that mineral ilmenite in the ground up there. And, and it's usually, a lot of mines don't meet their demise by running out of the, of the ore mineral. A lot of them right. just, it, it changes in economics and uh, price of materials, the technology, all of that is usually more responsible for a mine closure than it is of uh, or blaming just, oh, we ran out of ore. It's usually not, almost never that. So uh, I guess one last place that I want to kind of mention is Racket Lake and that sort of surrounding area. Uh, so SUNY Cortland owns a, uh, a little camp, a historic camp up around there. So, uh, I know we went there for one of our trips that is really, really memorable to me. And, uh, so do, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the camp up there? Oh, I'd love to. I, uh, I'm, I'm so happy that you brought up, uh, uh, the Racket Lake area. Um, so, um, one of the very, there were many visitors to Racket Lake over the years, but the, the first visitor, visitor that had a lot of money and resources, um, was William West Durant. Uh, he was the son of Thomas Clark Durant. Thomas Clark Durant built the eastern half of the Transcontinental Railroad. 
Uh, and so he had a lot of resources. Uh, and when he passed away in 1885, his son uh, inherited much of his fortune uh, and he used it to build uh, great camps in the Adirondacks. And so William West Durant's first camp was in Racket Lake uh, on a place called Pine Knot Point. And his first camp was called Camp Pine Knot. And it was his first uh, great camp uh, that he built. And, and eventually that fell into the hands of SUNY Cortland. And as I say, my employer now owns that uh, facility. He also built a great camp Uncas. Uh, he built that for JP Morgan uh, back in the mm -hmm. late, in the late 1890s, or I'm sorry, in the mid 1890s. Um, and then he also built Camp Sagamore, which is probably his finest uh, great camp. Uh, and great Camp Sagamore was for himself, but he ended up selling it to Alfred Vanderbilt um, uh, around, the, around the turn of the century. So, uh, so he built those three great camps. Um, and just to kind of give you a, a little side information, when you and I visited there, one mm -hmm. of the things that we were interested in is the source of the stone that Durant used to build all of his exquisite fireplaces and chimneys over there. Right. Um, and, uh, and so that was kind of an area that I did some research on last fall. Um, and I'm still working on writing up those results, but, <laughs> but, but it's, um, but I've, I've got some pretty interesting conclusions. Um, and so I'm, as I say, I'm in the process of writing that up. And, uh, uh, and so that was kind of a, that was a neat little project to work on to try to figure out where they got that stone from to build those, those great fireplaces. Yeah. And I, I remember you, you telling us, oh, they kept all these exquisite records of when each building in the camp was built and where they got this thing from and where they got that thing from. And then they just never thought to keep notes on where they got the stone for all the chimneys. Exactly. Uh, so that was a, uh, that seems like a bad idea. Like, yeah. just, I, I mean, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's just bad record keeping. Right. Well, because it's like the the all the buildings is you know as well made as you know they probably were, especially with how much money he had. Uh, you know the the stones what's going to be there for the longest. So you'd think you know four hundred years in the future. Not that they were probably <laughs> thinking that far, but uh, that's what's still going to be there. Not so much the buildings. You know, you know, you're right, Gavin. And the funny thing is, is that you know if you go to England, there are stone castles over there that are a thousand years mm -hmm. old. You know, and that's the only thing that remains. Uh, right. And and so, you know, if you build something out of wood, you know, chances are it's not going to last very long. Um, you know, if you make your tombstone out of marble, you know, you're not going to see that lettering on the tombstone, at least in the northeast right. part of the United States. You're not going to see that 100 years later or maybe 150 years later. So if you're really thinking far in advance, uh, you probably want to build your tombstone or choose your tombstone out of something that's going to be around for a long period of time. I Personally, I like the idea of a, a sandstone a tombstone or a, or a quartzite tombstone because those two minerals that make up those rocks, they don't chemically weather. And so they're right. going to be around for who knows how long, you know, maybe tens of thousands of years. So I guess to sort of start to, to wrap up here, uh, you mentioned that you sort of grew up in and around the Adirondacks, but why, why did you choose to study the Adirondacks themselves? You know, because you, you said you went away. For, uh, for for college and, and grad school. So why why come back to the Adirondacks? Well, my my uh, the area of geology that I was most interested in and, and that I studied in graduate school um, dealt with uh, mostly igneous rocks, intrusive igneous rocks and, and metamorphic rocks and sort of uh, hydrothermal concentrations of minerals like gold and silver and, and things of that nature. And when I moved back to New York State after uh, I got my master's degree out west, um, I thought that if I was going to stay here in the East Coast and work, I needed a research area where I could work on those kinds of rocks that kind of um, that I was best trained to work on and that I really enjoyed working on. And so uh, having grown up in the Adirondacks, I figured this is kind of a perfect match for me because I'm already familiar with the area. And uh, and I'm also kind of trained in studying those kinds of rocks that occur um, in the Adirondacks. And those, those were probably the two main reasons why I chose to work in the Adirondacks. And, there, and there's fascinating geology in the Adirondacks. And, and the other thing, um, and maybe Mike can attest to this, is that, you know, when you're, when you're uh, out hiking in the Adirondacks, it's just, it's kind of un, almost unparalleled beauty, you know, especially on a nice day. Uh, and so if you, if you're going to 
choose an area to do research in, um, you know, a place like the Adirondacks is, uh, it's, it's kind of pretty and it's, it's fun being there. It's nice being there. And if you happen to want to study the rocks under your feet, you know, that, that's an added bonus. And, you know, I certainly haven't traveled as much uh, as you have, but just, you know, it, it's what hooked me. I had never climbed a mountain before until I was 23 years old, I believe. Huh. And I climbed um, just with a bunch of people. I climbed Bald Mountain, which is not one of the high peaks. Um, it's what's called part of the Fire Tower Challenge. Right. And I climbed and just like it hit me. I was like, oh, God, I get it now. I get why people do this. <laughs> it was, right. It, you know, the, the, the you know, the fog had lifted from my eyes and I had seen God and you know, it just, <laughs> it all had, and that's, you know, and that's what hooked me to kind of want to be far more outdoorsy because, you know, as far as my parents were concerned, particularly my mother, the outdoors was to be like read about and seen on TV. And that's about it. Not experienced firsthand. Um, and when you're actually out there experiencing it, um, not just the nature itself, but the people out there too. I mean, I was out there by myself. Um, for quite a lot of the summer and just the people were, you know, nice as can be uh, all up and down. So it's, you know, highly recommended kind of whatever you're into, there's probably a place for you somewhere in the Adirondacks. Yeah, I, I would agree with that uh, wholeheartedly, Mike. And, and I have to tell you uh, that you and I share one uh, uh, commonality and that is my first mountain was Bald Mountain. Also. You're kidding. No, I'm serious. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my that's, God. That's, uh, that's same awesome. one. I, I had same, no idea. Yeah, same one. And I and and I got to tell you because I I grew up in the Western Adirondacks where where Bald Mountain is located near uh -huh. Old near Old Forge, um, and the part of the Adirondacks where where I have a place now is it's called Branchingham, New York, and mm -hmm. um, it's kind of flattish in that area. It's in the Adirondack Park, but it's kind of flattish. And if I wanted to go climb a mountain, I had to go drive into the mountains. And the first mountain that you know, was kind of publicly known and had a trail uh, to the to the to the summit was was Bald Mountain, and that was the first one I climbed to. Yeah, that was. Um, I mean, <laughs> that's just incredible. Yeah. It's. <laughs> I mean, this was a couple of years ago. Now, my recollection was, as somebody who had never climbed a mountain before, it was not exactly like world's most difficult mountain to climb. You could get it up it if you were in reasonable shape. Sure. Uh, and so, I guess we have a dual endorsement here. <laughs> on bald mountain if you're listening to this and you've never climbed a mountain before throw on a uh you know a nice pair of boots um and get out there because it's absolutely worth it yeah i think I, that's a great idea and and i gotta tell you the 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 description that you're giving about how it made you feel um is something that i've i've witnessed myself for example um i've taken students uh to climb bald mountain also but I've also taken students, the last time I took, took them to a bigger peak, uh, we went up kind of to the northwest uh, part of the Adirondacks and climbed Ampersand. And uh, mm -hmm. Ampersand, as, as you know, has a very open summit. Uh, and there were students on my, on my field trip um, class who had never climbed a mountain before. They had no idea what it was like. And of course, Ampersand's a pretty steep hike and it was difficult mm -hmm. getting up. We took all morning to get up there. But when we got to the summit, a couple of my students actually, it was, they were brought to tears. And I watched the tears in their, uh, roll down from their eyes after viewing you know, the, the great expanse of the Adirondacks from the summit of Ampersand. And that's how, that's how emotional it was for them. And, uh, and so, so to witness that and, and sort of um, be a part of, of getting something like, like that started was really special. I, I cannot say it any better than that, so I certainly won't try to, other than just once again, if you're out there and, you know, if you are somehow listening to this podcast and you have not tried to, uh, to climb a mountain somewhere, be it the Adirondacks or somewhere else, you know, try and get on top of a mountain because it is, it, try it once. If it's not for you, then it's not for you, but it, it might be the one thing you didn't know you wanted. Absolutely. Uh, I, I definitely agree. And you know, I had been in and around the Adirondacks a bit before I came to Cortland, um, but definitely taking all the trips uh, for, for you know, Dr. Bob's various classes uh, really gave me the the itch to, to keep going. Uh, so I remember like my first week of grad school, our geology department was taking a weekend trip, well, a, a long weekend trip to Yellowstone because it was about eight hours away. And... 
uh, the first chance I got where someone was like, hey, do we want to go hike this this peak? Uh, as long as it was like more than like three people, I was like, oh, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, that continued. Mike came out to visit me while I lived in California and we got to hang out uh, in and around the Sierras. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, it all it all started back in the Adirondacks. So. Wow. I guess before we sign off, Mike, do you have any last burning questions about the Adirondacks? Um, I I suppose the, the one dirty little secret about the Adirondacks, uh, about the Adirondack High Peaks, is you know there's famously 46 Adirondack High Peaks, which are supposed to be the 46 mountains that are um, at 4,000 feet above sea level or higher. Um, the dirty little secret is that four of those peaks are not actually 4,000 feet tall. <laughs> You're right. And the dirtier little secret is that there's one peak that at least at one point was measured at 4,000 feet that has been left off that list. Wow. Um, uh, McNaughton Mountain. And so I'm wondering if you have any insight as to kind of what that process was for um, for measuring those those high peaks back you know 150 years ago or whatever this took place how did this took place and how did we wind up with you know the 46 that we know today wow that's a fantastic question and i i don't know if i can give you a complete answer i i know that those original surveys were done by Ver, verplanck calvin he was the surveyor uh in the 18 uh late 1800s uh, and they would go around and set up these signal towers on top of mountains, and they would triangulate their locations uh, and try to measure their elevations um, with, you know, with the best surveying equipment they had at that time. Uh, the see, the thing is, I don't know if they if they put signal towers on top of all of the mountains. My guess is that they probably didn't, and probably some of the mountains they they probably just kind of did their best estimate of their elevation with the surveying equipment right. that they had without maybe a signal tower. Um, so uh, I guess I'm not, I'm not as well-versed in, in surveying uh, techniques at that time, but um, you know, it was, I always thought it was kind of funny because a couple of those mountains on the lower part of that list, they would, the elevation would be like exactly 4,000. I'm like, come on, come on, man. Like, like two or three mountains were like exactly 4,000. I'm like, yeah, that's right. a little, that's a little fishy. Just right. a little bit. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm just, my best guess, Mike, is that, that some of those mountains that, you know, that got kicked off the list, maybe they, maybe they just did their best at estimating the height of those mountains and, and not actually getting a, a very accurate measurement on their altitude. I, that's the only thing I can think of. That makes, I mean, that makes complete sense to me just given the time period at which this was taking place um the uh the shortest of the 46 couche gras you've got to go up one mountain to get to it and then cross like an entire swamp <laughs> somewhere else it's it's a giant pain in the butt and the only thing you're thinking of is man this mountain's only three thousand something feet tall why do i even have to do this yeah, that's right i know because <laughs> so, it's on the list it's on the list of 46 yep. even though it's not it's not exactly. you know more than four thousand and I, I will tell you one other thing that um uh those mountains that got dropped from the bottom of the list um there is one mountain that's kind of outside the high peaks region and that is snowy mountain it's just to the west of indian lake it's a shade under four thousand it's like uh I don't know, 3899 or something like that. It's pretty okay. close to 3,900 feet. And it's actually taller than a couple of those peaks that got kicked off the list. <laughs> I can so believe that, it, yeah. So that's another little dirty secret. <laughs> What's it called again? It's Snowy Mountain. I want to put that on my list right now. It's a fantastic hike. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the tallest mountain kind of in that region. There is a fire tower at the top. Um, it's pretty steep at the summit. And it's got a big cliff on the eastern side. Uh, an eastern face, and it's uh, you really it, it, when you drive by the Indian Lake area and you look down, you're like, oh my god, that's a that's a pretty tall mountain down there. So if you have a chance to do, you know, I think it's probably maybe my guess is it's probably maybe two to three hours in something like that um, to get to the summit, and then maybe I don't know two hours coming out. Uh, so it's not a it's not an all day kind of thing, but it's um, uh, but it's definitely uh, rewarding once you get up on the top of that fire tower. 
I'm looking at it right now, and I don't know if you were doing that from memory, but 3,899 feet is exactly yeah. what Snowy Mountain <laughs> okay, says. Yeah. That. So, yeah, it's awesome. from memory. Trust me. It's just from memory. <laughs> uh, well, well done on that. And thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast and talking about something that kind of the three of us um, in different ways, but the three of us all have in common. This was quite a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, uh, uh, I could talk about the Adirondacks all day, but I know we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Well, I'm sure we can have you back on another podcast at some point. But until then, this has been episode 93 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That was Gavin. And that was Dr. Bob talking about the Adirondacks. We'll see everybody next week. Until then, take care, everybody. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.